Welcome to Lab 6 for Biology 139. We're going to be looking at respiration. And as always, you start out with a worksheet. You're to look up these answers. But as we go through the lab, you should be able to, to see if the things that we do in lab explain to you or make this um, more meaningful to you. Otherwise, you're just memorizing a bunch of things that you've looked up on YouTube or Google or wherever you go to get your information. One of the questions on your worksheet are what are the three chemical stimuli that affect breathing? So I typed in three chemical stimuli breathing and it says carbon dioxide, hydrogen ions, and oxygen. So that kind of makes sense. You breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide, so that would be pretty obvious. What isn't always completely obvious is hydrogen ions, and that has to do with the pH. So breathing in and breathing out regulates the pH of your body, your blood especially. So hydrogen ions are very, very important. And if you acidify your blood with too much carbon dioxide, because when carbon dioxide dissolves in your plasma, it makes carbonic acid. And you've encountered carbonic acid whenever you drink a Coke or a Pepsi or a whatever fizzy drink that you drink. What the fizz is is actually carbon dioxide. And that's what makes it so acidic. And that's why when you drink it and sometimes you burp, it burns your nose because it's so acidic. And you probably in, in middle school took teeth and put them down and a Coke or something and took it out after a day or two and it would have eaten the enamel off the tooth or you can put an egg in and it'll eat the the shell off the egg and you'll just have the membrane you can see inside and see the yolk. So carbon dioxide is extremely acidic when it's dissolved in the bloodstream. So if you've got too much carbon dioxide you've acidified your body and now the hydrogen ions are playing a role in what's going on in your body. If you want to know about the Herring Brewer inflation reflex, some dude named it after himself, actually two guys, and it is a reflex as you stretch your airways, if you stretch the bronchial tubes and the bronchioles, which are the little teeny tiny branches off of the bronchial tubes, then it's going to send a message which will prevent you from overinflating your lungs. You have three respiratory groups that we want you to look at, the ventral, the dorsal, and the pontine respiratory groups. Where do they work? Down inside of your lungs or your bronchial tubes. And where inside of the brain do they come from? Usually, you're going to find that it's not the brain itself, but it's going to be the medulla oblongata. Then you're to look at the central chemoreceptors and the peripheral. So central would be more towards the brain and the spinal cord, and peripheral would be further out, like in your lungs. Some of you have probably heard about hyperventilation, and that's where you are breathing so fast because you're terrified that sometimes you actually pass out. And then, of course, when you pass out, you start breathing normally. And I'm going to throw this in because one of the things that your kids or your grandkids are going to do to you is say, well, if you don't give me whatever it is that I want, I'm going to hold my breath until I die, and then you'll be sorry. Well, you can't hold your breath until you die, because if you hold your breath long enough, you'll pass out, and then you'll start breathing normally. So just tell them, go ahead, go ahead, honey, and I'll cry at your funeral. And they'll be so shocked that they'll probably quit doing whatever it is they're doing. Here's one of the key things for understanding how your lungs work is how much do you normally breathe in and breathe out? So that's your tidal volume. And your inspiratory reserve volume is if you want to take a deep breath and scream or take a deep breath and sing a long, long, long note, then you need a large inspiratory reserve volume. So you can actually stretch this and work this. So obviously a musician, or uh, someone who dives for pearls would have a larger inspiratory reserve volume than you and I would have. And then the expiratory reserve volume, how much can you blow out of your lungs? 
how much can you exhale? And this is one that a lot of people don't realize that they have, but you have a residual volume, and this is the amount you never, ever breathe out. You can't, because if you actually were successful in breathing out all of the air in your lungs, even your residual volume, the air that's left after you've finished blowing out as much as you can, then your lungs would collapse. So you definitely don't want that to happen. So when we do the um, cells and look at them, we're going to learn about surfactant and how it keeps our lungs from collapsing. But you always have some air left behind in your lungs, no matter how hard you try to breathe it all out. And your total lung capacity is all the way from the inspiratory reserve volume, top of it, to the bottom of the expiratory reserve volume. So that's your total lung capacity, including your reserve or residual capacity, the part that you don't exhale. Now, I wanted to show you this because men and women have different lung capacities, but we always, whenever we're learning it, we always learn the men's. So this tells you how many liters that your lungs can hold in a breath. Vital capacity is how much of your lungs you can use, remembering that there's part of the lung total capacity that you can't use because it's your reserve volume, that you, you can't exhale it. Now you can memorize those formulas that were on the last screen, or you can just use common sense. And this little graph kind of shows you what we're going to see when we do the labs today, uh, one and two. Now those of you who can't come to lab and work, then you'll just have to watch these videos and calculate from these pictures. So here is someone, a guy, with a total lung capacity of about 6,000 milliliters, which would be six liters. And this is breathing in, breathing out, everything's just normal, not doing anything just sitting there listening to uh, me talk or whatever. That's called your tidal volume. The breath goes in, the breath goes out, just like the tide on the beach. So they call it tidal volume, T-I-D-A-L. And then you say, okay, breathe out as much as you possibly can. So here's your tidal and you're going down, but instead of stopping and taking another breath, you keep pushing, you keep pushing, you keep pushing until you get the maximum amount you can push out of your lungs. And that's called your expiratory reserve volume. And you measure it here from this down, right there. That's your expiratory. So you start at this part right here, so coming over here, that's about 2,500. And you go down to about 1,000. So this person has an expiratory reserve volume of about 1,500. Okay, so we, we go do this purple area right there. And tidal is the kind of the teal color there. And now you go back and you do your tidal volume again. And then you say, okay, take the deepest breath that you possibly can. Fill your lungs as full as you can. So you take this really, 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 really deep breath. You go all the way up here, and then you come all the way down here. Now, to measure the inspiratory reserve volume, you start at the top of the tidal volume, and you go up to the top, and you come back down. So they've colored it in nicely for you in kind of a a, uh, I don't know what that color is, a beigey, orangey looking color. Anyway, so that's your inspiratory reserve volume. And you can see that if you add the expiratory reserve volume and the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume, so you get the expiratory, inspiratory, and tidal, you add those three together, you're going to get your vital capacity. And then if you look down here, here's the residual volume. It's usually about a liter, give or take a little bit from zero, a little over a thousand, because this is a guy, so their lungs are a little bit bigger. So there's your residual volume right there. I don't know why we have an, an advertisement for Pinterest on there, but uh, if you haven't tried Pinterest, it's kind of fun.
All right, so if you want the total volume of the lungs, all the way from the biggest it can get when you inhale to the all the way down to the residual volume if you completely collapsed the lungs and got every last bit of air out of it, then that would be your total lung capacity, total lung capacity, okay? So you have inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, tidal, vital capacity, and total lung capacity. So it's just common sense. So stop the video and see if you can do this. What is the tidal volume? It was about half a liter, 500 milliliters. What was your inspiratory reserve volume? When you breathe in as much as you can. Your expiratory reserve volume, you breathe out as far as you can. Your residual volume, that that you cannot get out no matter what you do. Your total lung capacity, which is all of these added together, and your vital capacity, which is all of these added together except for the residual volume. Because, te well, they say you can't use it, but you actually do use it because you're exchanging gases down there, uh, which is what you do with your lungs. You exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. And here is a graph, and you're to fill this out. So, Oh my goodness, it looks awfully like the one that I just had over there. And they're saying if the vital capacity is 4,800 milliliters, which would be 4.8 liters, and the total volume, excuse me, tidal volume is 600 milliliters, and the expiratory reserve volume is 1,300 milliliters, they want you to uh, answer some of the questions about the other measurements. So calculate the patient's inspiratory reserve volume using those. So you will be seeing questions like that on um, the quiz and lab exam too. So make sure that you can do this math. It's not that hard. Just remember what you add. And remember that the inspiratory reserve, you start from the top of the title and go up. And for the expiratory reserve, you start from the bottom of the title and go down. Don't add in the tidal volume. That's one mistake I see students make. We have five sets of experiments that we're going to use the biopack. And again, for those of you who can't come to lab, we have the pictures and you can read the values off of the pictures. We also have videos of some of the other lab professors doing the biopack for you. So here's the first of the five experiments that we're going to do. And when you just breathe normally for three breaths. So that's going to get your tidal volume for you. And then you want to inhale as deeply as you can, and that will give you your inspiratory reserve volume. And then exhale deeply and get your expiratory reserve volume. And then inhale deeply as hard as you can and exhale. And that will give you your vital capacity. So I'll give you everything. And you can just assume that your reserve volume is going to be about 1,000. All right. The second exercise that you're going to do is you're going to exercise... And then you're going to look at the frequency of your breath and how much you take in with each breath. So you probably can figure this out if you've ever run and run and run and you end up panting. <sighs> so you're obviously breathing a lot more rapidly than you do if you're just kind of sitting there chilling. And your amount that you pull in, you're trying to get more air in so that you can get more energy, more oxygen, and you keep going. So the answers to these are kind of obvious, but it's kind of fun to watch if you do it on the, the biopack and confirm it. The last three experiments you can do at home. You don't need the biopack. All you need is just uh, someone to sit there and help you count your breaths. So the first worksheet for the first protocol is they want you to get your tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and vital capacity. So we actually have some experimental data, and I'll put that up, and you can use it to calculate.
So this is what your tracing would look like. And this one is just Air Force right there. And we don't really uh, look at that. We want to look at this one, which is the volume of air that's coming in and out of your lungs. So clearly this is tidal volume right there, inspiratory reserve, tidal volume, expiratory reserve. Now the neat thing about the BioPack is you can place your cursor right here at the top of a tidal breath and pull it over to the bottom of a tidal breath. And right here, it gives you the answer. So it's about half a liter. Your tidal volume is about half a liter. To do your inspiratory reserve volume, you go from the highest point of inhaling. And remember, don't go down to the bottom. Go to the top of the tidal volume. So top of the tidal volume up here. And it tells you that's about 2.4 liters or 241, uh, 2,000, sorry, 2,418 milliliters, if you like milliliters better than liters. To do the expiratory reserve, we're going to go from the bottom of the tidal. So here's tidal up, tidal down. We're going to go from the bottom of that, and then we're going to the lowest point that we possibly can exhale. And so we draw our cursor from here over to there, and it tells you that that's going to be about 1.3, 1.29 liters, or 1,290 milliliters. So here's a man, and we're looking at his tidal volume, and we're looking to see, here's the top of the peak, here's the bottom of the peak. So we're measuring this, and it comes out to be about 0.72 liters. So normally it's about 0.5, but this being a man, they're going to have a little bit larger tidal volume than a woman would have. And then you can also count how many breaths that a person takes. So here's one breath, two breaths, three breaths. And if you notice, the really nice thing about the BioPack is it tells you here's two seconds, four seconds, six seconds. So at 15 seconds, you've had three breaths, actually three and a half breaths, and you can multiply that by, by four and see how many breaths this person normally takes when they're not doing anything special, just kind of sitting around. So you can get the volume, and you can get how many breaths per minute. Sounds a lot like the heart thing. How much does the heart fill, and how many beats do you get per minute? Only these are breaths per minute. So here's the same guy after a lot of exercise. And if you look, now his tidal volume is 1.2 liters. So he went from 0.7 liters to 1.2 liters. So he's gotten considerably more air with each breath. And if you go down here and look at the seconds, if you go across to 15 seconds, look how many breaths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven breaths. And you multiply that by four because there's four times 15 is 60 seconds. And that's how many times this person is breathing per minute. So they're obviously a, a lot more than just the 12 from last time. The third experiment you don't need the bio pack for, you just need somebody to watch you. So if you take the deepest breath you possibly can, how long can you hold your breath? And you're probably less than two minutes. But there are actually people who dive for pearls that can hold their breath for almost seven minutes. So it's truly amazing if you exercise how much, how long you can hold your breath underwater. If you, however, breathe out as much as you possibly can and then you hold your breath, you're not going to be able to hold your breath as long because you're going to run out of oxygen and your body's going to kick in and say, uh-uh, you need to breathe. So about a half a minute if you're lucky. And if you inhale, it's called inspiration. And when you exhale, it's expiration. 
And one of the questions that they have that you did at the beginning, you had to look up what the Herring Brewer reflex. So these stretch receptors, and while you're looking at that Herring Brewer reflex, see which of these three groups, the ventral respiratory group, the dorsal respiratory group, or the pontine respiratory group is working with the herring brewer reflex. That's just a little hint. The fourth experiment, you're going to hyperventilate. So breathe normally for a minute and then hyperventilate one deep breath every two seconds for about a half a minute and then record your breathing rate after the hyperventilation has been completed. So most people think the hyperventilation is just a lot of really, really fast, <laughs> shallow breaths that's panting. But hyperventilation is, is taking in a lot of air too many times, you know, like every two seconds. So you're going to need somebody to count this for you. And you probably want to sit down when you're doing it because you can actually hyperventilate and pass out. So try hyperventilating after 30 seconds. Do it again for one minute. And then hold your breath for as long as you can and see if you can hold your breath longer or shorter. So that'll be interesting. Did you add more oxygen into your body or did you add more carbon dioxide into your body by hyperventilating? So I'm not going to spoil the surprise. You have to do this yourself. And since you know that this is going to be either oxygen or hydrogen or carbon dioxide, you need to figure out which one changed because you were hyperventilating. Why do you become so dizzy after you hyperventilate? And the fifth experiment is breathing into a paper bag. So I may be spoiling it a little bit for you, but one of the things, if you have somebody that's freaking out, something happens so... Uh, intensely emotional in their life that they're hyperventilating and they're they're uh, threatening to faint make them breathe into a paper bag if you re-breathe your air it will kind of negate some of the problems you have if you're hyperventilating and hopefully while they're busy breathing into the bag you can talk them down you can you know try to calm them down so protocol five shows you what happens if you breathe into a paper bag and then you do hyperventilation and breathe into a paper bag again and see why would that fix the problems you have with hyperventilation. And it says explain your results in terms of chemoreceptors and respiratory drive. All righty. Now, the next thing that you need to know is you need to know about the different tissues that you're going to find inside of the lungs. It helps to know what we're looking at. We're looking at something under the slide. So here's a picture. Up here, where they've cut it away, is your larynx or your voice box. Or if it's a guy, we call it an Adam's apple because it sticks out kind of far. And then you come down and these rings of hyaline cartilage, they make up your trachea. And if they do a tracheotomy, they just make an incision. They just cut between these rings and put a little tube in there. You can put a straw, you can put a piece of an ink pen, if you unscrew an ink pen, and just put the shaft of the ink pen if you have to do an emergency tracheotomy. Hopefully, that doesn't happen. But if you can't get air through here, down, then that's, that's where you go. You just make a little incision and put something in there that will hold it open. And now you can breathe out of the hole in your uh, throat. Now, what really grosses me out is when I go to a hospital and I'm outside and people have cancer. They usually have oral cancer. Uh, so what they do, they have to do a tracheotomy on them. And they have a hole permanently installed in their neck so they can breathe out of their neck. And they will actually put the cigarette up to the hole and breathe through the hole in their neck. I'm like, do you not realize that the cigarettes are probably what put you in the hospital in the first place and made you have to have a tracheotomy? But anyway, you can't talk to people who are addicted to 
to nicotine. I've tried. So your trachea is going to come down. It's going to branch off into the left and the right. And the little intersection point is called the carina, which is kind of a fun name, the carina. And there's your left bronchial tube and your right bronchial tube. And it's going to branch off on the right in three places because you have three lobes of the lung over here and two over here because you only have two lobes of the lung over on this side. And then it's going to branch again and again. And when you finally get to these little bitty branches, we call those uh, bronchioles. So when you have bronchitis, you have an inflammation of your bronchial tubes. Here are two slides from your lab manual that you need to know. These are goblet cells right there making mucus. There's cilia right there that are moving mucus along. And if you look, here's a higher magnification. You can see the goblet cells a lot better over here. And if I move this over, you can see here are cuboidal cells in a ring. So you know that they're secreting something into this lumen. And so that would be some more mucus for you. So you really need a lot of mucus in your throat to capture anything that you breathe in because you don't want to breathe it in and then it fall down into your lungs where it can remain and grow. So you want any worm eggs, bacteria, fungus, spores, things like that to get stuck in this layer of mucus. And these cilia are pushing upwards towards your larynx, towards your voice box. So the mucus, instead of pooling down into your lungs, you would think it'd be pushing down into your lungs, but that's not the way direction you want it to go. You want it to go forward up your throat. And then at your voice box, your um, esophagus and your trachea meet. And so all of that mucus that's being pushed up, pushed up, can then go down in the esophagus and be destroyed by acid, or else you can cough it up. And one of the things that all the teachers will tell you is if you smoke, it paralyzes the cilia. And if you continue to smoke, your cells won't even make cilia. So all the mucus that you make with your goblet cells and that you're secreting out of these uh, secretory glands in through here or ducts are going to it's going to run down into your lungs and so if you've ever been around somebody when they wake up in the morning and have smokers cough it sounds like they're coughing up a lung but what they're doing is they're trying to get all the mucus that pooled in their lungs overnight they have to get it out by coughing it up so gross if you're considering smoking because you're off to college for you know the first time you're away from your folks and you can try out different things, smoking isn't one of the ones that you want to try. So those slides we were looking at, they took a slice through the trachea and they looked on the inside so you could see the cilia that line the inside of this tube. And you can see the hyaline cartilage that makes up these rings. The next thing we're going to look at is part of the lung tissue. And it actually looks like bunches of grapes. And if you cut into one of the grape looking things, you find it's hollow. And that's because you're going to fill it up with air. So on the outside, you have capillaries. And we learned that capillaries are made out of squamous epithelial cells. And these are also squamous epithelial cells. So you, when you have very, very flat cells for your blood vessels, and you have very, very flat cells for your alveoli, or the parts of the lung, then you're going to be able to pass oxygen and carbon dioxide quickly across because you have one flat cell laying against another flat cell. And here's a picture of real alveoli, and these are the bronchioles. So you have the bronchial tubes that branch off into smaller 
bronchioles, and then you have the tiny, tiny alveoli at the ends of each of those bronchial tubes. Excuse me, bronchioles at the ends of bronchial tubes. So here's where we've cut in, and you can actually see those grape-like sacs. And these are squamous epithelial cells, so it says down here, number four is simple squamous epithelial cells. And at the intersections, you're going to see some cuboidals. And those cuboidals are going to be making surfactant. If you go to YouTube and type in Abyss Rat Breathing Liquid, you get this video. It's part of a movie called The Abyss. All this stuff, fluid breathing system, we just got them. You use it when you go really deep. How deep? Deep. How deep? It's classified. Anyway, you breathe liquid so you can't get compressed. The pressure doesn't get you. You mean you got liquid in your lungs? Oxygenated fluorocarbon emulsion. Bullshit. Check this out. Uh, can I borrow your rat? What, what are you doing? Hey, hey, hey. No, you no, 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 no. You're gonna wait. kill her! It's okay, I've done this myself. Oh, man, look, what are you, you just drowning her? She's gonna be fine. I breathed this myself. Gonna be fine. No, man, she, she's gonna drown. Look, look, she's freaking out. Just going through a normal adjustment period. Normal? Does this look normal to you? She's gonna drown. She's taking the fluid into his lungs. She's taking the fluid into his lungs. There he goes. So there's a bit of anxiety here. Now he's starting to relax. He's breathing fine. See his chest moving? Getting plenty of oxygen. <laughs> Another thing that you see, you just kind of think it's like dirt or something, but you have white blood cells rolling around in your alveoli, and they call them dust cells. But they're just rolling around eating the stuff that made it into your lungs to keep it from growing. And you remember those cilia that we were talking about that are on top of the pseudo-stratified epithelium? Well, here's what they look like. You can see the dust cells which are white blood cells, and a bunch of the things that it's caught in the mucus being pushed upwards. So I've forgotten how many million white blood cells you swallow that were pushed up your throat out of your lungs. And one of the last things we're going to do in the lab is we're going to learn the parts of the respiratory model so here's a list of all the things that you're going to have to know. And then we have some pictures. So I would print this page out with all the things. Like, where is the larynx? Where is the voice box on this model? So you come down here, and it's this area right here. All of this makes up the voice box or the larynx. And this is the thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage. There's your trachea, which is B. So that's another thing you're supposed to find is the trachea. Then you want to look at the right lung versus the left lung. And this is kind of important because the left lung only has two lobes, and they're separated by this oblique fissure. And the right side has three lobes and here's your horizontal fissure so if you look inside here's a better picture right here you can see the three lobes and here are the two lobes so this is a cutaway and this is the outside part and here's the diaphragm right here so the lungs themselves don't inflate and deflate they just ride up and down on the diaphragm which is a membrane attached to some muscle right there. And so as you uh, contract your muscles and expand your muscles, the lungs are pressed. 
That's why, have you ever wondered why CPR works? You're just putting your hands on someone's chest and pushing down. But what you're doing is like what the diaphragm would do. You're pushing the air out, and then when you take your hands off, they reinflate, and then you push down again, you push the air out. So when you're not unconscious or choking, then you can use your diaphragm to do that for you. You notice the emphasis on the right lung, the left lung, the right primary bronchial tube, or bronchus, the left primary bronchus. Be sure that you remember it's not your left and your right, it's the patient's left and the patient's right. So if you're looking at this lung right here, you'd reach out with your right hand and touch it, but it's your left lung. The other thing that gives it away, besides that it only has two lobes, is it has a notch right there for your heart to stick in. So your heart actually sticks in that part right there. Here are the three branches that are going to the three lobes. Here are the two branches that are going to the two lobes. There's your carina right there, the intersection, where it forks off to the right and the left. One thing it wants you to label, but you actually can't see it, are the hyla. You have a left and a right hilum. Plural is hyla. And that's the opening into the lung where the blood vessels come in and the bronchial tubes come in. So it's just an opening. It, if, if you had a, well, this area in green would be your hilum right there. So, but the picture that we have is from the side, so you can't see down inside. So there's no way into the lung except for right there. The right lung has a superior, middle, and inferior lobe. But the left, since it only has two, it has superior and inferior. So that's fairly easy. And you need to know the difference between bronchus, which is singular, and bronchi, which is plural, and bronchiole, which is little teeny tiny bronchial tube. And here's a dissected pig. So there's the voice box on the pig. They, instead of talking, squeal. And there is their trachea. And those hyaline cartilage rings, you can see the rings, there's a membrane around them. So it, you have to come down here where some of the membrane is torn away to see those rings. And they don't go all the way around to the back. So in the back, you have your esophagus. And so you swallow, and your esophagus can allow food to pass through. So it's behind the trachea. And I mentioned that the larynx is a kind of a, a two-way valve. So you can either go down the trachea, the windpipe, or you can go down the esophagus to the stomach. So it's really important if you're putting in a feeding tube that you don't go to the front or to the anterior of the patient and put the feeding tube down their windpipe or if you're trying to intubate somebody so that you can breathe for them, that you don't put the intubation tube down the esophagus so you're blowing air into the stomach. So it's important to realize that there is a, a you can go two different ways from the voice box. You already know that. If you're sitting there trying to talk and you're trying to eat something and swallow at the same time, then you end up with the food going down into your lungs and so you're coughing and coughing and coughing and then hopefully you know about the Heimlich maneuver because this is bigger here and this is smaller there so if you get too big of a piece of food stuck right there then you can't breathe so you have to push uh, a air out and hopefully you can dislodge whatever is stuck in the person's throat otherwise you could do a tracheotomy and they can breathe through that hole in their windpipe in the hole in their, their trachea until you can get them to the hospital and they can get whatever it is removed from the larynx. Here's the heart, and if they hadn't taken the lung away, you could see it sticking in eh, a little better. They've kind of pulled it back so that you can see the heart a little bit better. And your diaphragm, 
comes up, comes up, goes over like that. And then it, it rests on the liver. So it's, it, divi it divides the abdomen from the thoracic region, the thorax. Our next lab will talk about the digestive system. So we'll start looking down here at the uh, stomach, the intestines, excretory. And here are the parts of the fetal pig that you need to know. So you need to know that its nose is called a rostrum. You and I would call it a snout, but they call it a rostrum. And the nostrils, where pigs don't pick their nose like little kids do, but if they could, the place where you stick your finger to pick your nose would be your external nares. And we looked at the larynx, the trachea, the right and left lung, and the diaphragm. So even though we're not doing the digestive system this time, the words for the fetal pig are included in this particular uh, part of the lab manual. So let's see if we can figure this out. All right, you guys know that your esophagus, so here's your esophagus right there, comes down, and you can't see the stomach. And most people think that their stomach is down here, and it is not. Uh, you actually can't see the stomach here. You'd have to lift this stuff out of the way. It's over on the left side, and it comes down. And here's your liver. Liver's the biggest organ with the exception of your skin. So it's your biggest internal organ. So it's usually pretty easy. Also, it's, it's so full of blood that it's always a really, really bright red. Or in this case, since this pig is dead, it's kind of a, you know, a old blood colored. If you could lift the liver up, like you lift your skirt up and look under your skirt, if you could lift the liver up, right in here is the gallbladder. But you can't see it in this particular picture. And at the intersection of the stomach and the intestines is the pancreas. And the pancreas is a very spongy, um, uh, not very solid organ. And unfortunately, uh, in humans, if you get pancreatic cancer, it spreads really, really quickly because this is touching so many things in the stomach. So if you can see the uh, large intestines and the small intestines, the large intestines are called the spiral colon, and the small intestines, here are the small intestines, so you can follow them over. And if we could lift up this, not only could we see the gallbladder, but we could see the stomach over there. So we're just missing that piece right there because these things are in the way. All right, so when you see this, the large spiral colon, you know, that's the large intestine, and when you see the small, small, kind of twisty, uh, small intestines, small intestines refers to the diameter, not the length of it. So your small intestines are much longer than your large intestines. And uh, one time I was showing this to a student, and they looked at me and go, is that chitlins? And I said, yes, it is. That's chitlins. That's what you're looking at. One of the things I always tell my students is when you come out of the stomach, the food is covered with stomach acid. And if you just dump it directly into the small intestines without diluting that acid or neutralizing that acid, it'll literally eat a hole in your small intestines. And when you do that, we, we call it a duodenal ulcer. So you've probably heard of people having a duodenal ulcer. So the function of the pancreas, besides to make insulin, is to neutralize the acid that comes out of your stomach as it enters your small intestine. It also has your digestive enzymes. So the food that's been broken down in your stomach and is now in your small intestine in smaller pieces, now you can start using those digestive enzymes and breaking it up into smaller pieces and absorbing it into your body. And once you get to the end of the large intestines, the spiral colon, you get into the rectum. So it's kind of a holding chamber for the feces. And if you don't empty your rectum, when you get that stretch urge to empty it, then it dries out. 
So that's one of the things the rectum does is it pulls moisture out of the fecal mass. And if it'll just sit in there and get you'll get constipated. And then you get hemorrhoids. So you come past the rectum, and here's the anus, so that you can drop off that load of poo. So you can see the esophagus, and you cannot see the stomach. You can see the liver. You cannot see the gallbladder. You can see the pancreas and the small intestine and the large intestine, which is known as the spiral colon, in a pig, but not in you. Yours isn't a spiral. And then the rectum is the holding chamber and then the anus. So we looked at that, and let's go ahead and look at the urinary. So this is a girl pig, and you can see there's her little ovary. Looks like a little bean right there. And her uterus is really small. I mean, when you think of a uterus, you think, whoa, that's got a whole a baby. And you know that pigs have a whole big litter of babies. But this is a fetal pig. It's never been born yet. So they took it out of its mother before it was fully formed and um, uh, injected it with different colors of dyes and things so we could see the various bits and pieces of it. So the urinary system, here's your bladder right there, uh, your urethra, and your ureter, and here's your kidney. So the urinary system, while it is astounding, it's basically only got four parts. You've got your kidney, and this is the left kidney because it's on your right side, so it would be the pig's left kidney. And then there's the ureter where the urine's going to come down, and it's going to fill up the bladder, and then you're going to pee it out the urethra. Don't forget the quiz over the pre-lab worksheet. And make sure you practice calculating tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, residual volume. You can't actually calculate that one using the things that we're doing today. And total lung capacity versus vital capacity. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha,